welcome Rick Jackson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to VMworld 2011. We've got about 19,000 of our closest friends here with us this week. Unfortunately, we do have uh, a few that weren't able to make it in from the East Coast. And we just want to wish them well and safety and hope that they get through whatever challenges they may be facing this week. But for those of us that are here, we've got yet another great event teed up for you. And of course, it's because of the continual participation from you all, as well as our partners, that makes this event happen. So I'd like to start by thanking our diamond sponsors. These five companies contribute a significant amount to a full year commitment for both VMworld US and VMworld Europe as well as regional V forums throughout the globe. And we really appreciate how much they support our community and to put together events like this for you all. I also want to thank our platinum sponsors for VMworld US, who are also contributing significantly to help the program here that you're participating in. We want to thank all of our partners for their support and I encourage you all to go into Solutions Exchange, to walk around, see what products are available, what solutions are available that complement your investments in VMware technology. Because that's how you'll get the most value and return on that investment. Now, of course, rumor has it that a big draw for VMworld are the labs. So in 2009, we created a lab on site at Moscone Data Center that was based on a private cloud. In 2010, we took that model and made it a hybrid cloud. In 2011, this year here in Las Vegas, we are using a pure public cloud model. Three data centers, all off-site that will manage up to 24,000 lab hours. To give you a sense of scale, last year at VMworld, we approximately deployed 145,000 VMs over the course of that week. This year, we expect to deploy over 200,000 VMs. That is a highly dynamic and scalable cloud solution, all leveraging vSphere and vCloud Director. So our agenda for this week, later this, morning, or this afternoon, Paul Moritz will be coming out and talking about the new IT, discussing the bridge from existing IT architectures and the client-server world into the new cloud era. And following Paul, we have the pleasure of having three customers join Carl Eschenbach, our President of Customer Operations, up here on stage to talk about their specific journey towards this new cloud era and the value that each of these companies are receiving. Tomorrow morning, bright and early at 8 a.m., which I know you'll all be up for, we have Dr. Stephen Herod our Chief Technology Officer, doing a deeper dive on some of the technologies and products that you'll hear about, along with some great demonstrations to see how it all works together. Should be a great keynote tomorrow morning. Small highlight for the week, the VMworld party. Promises to be a killer of a party, but I'm bump. Wednesday evening from 7 to 9 o'clock actually will be here in this location. And for those of you that aren't necessarily ready to go out and gamble but like to play a little bit later in the night, we're doing something new this year, which is an after party. From 9 to 11 p.m. out in the pool areas 
of both the Venetian and the Palazzo so we can have a little bit more fun that night. However, we obviously want you to show up Thursday morning for another keynote at 9 a.m. So we thought we'd do something similar to last year, bring in some outside speakers talking on some very interesting topics around the brain, the mind, and the consciousness. I can't think of a better topic after a late night of partying and drinking. So hopefully you'll join us for that. And as is now our tradition, of course, we're going to put Steve Harrod through a little bit of testing again, because we really are trying to figure out how that man's mind works. So come Thursday and find out some more. Immediately following this keynote, we'll be opening up the Solutions Exchange. And we've got a great welcome reception so that everybody can start and start to go through the booths, talk to the partners. We've got some entertainment that's happening as we open that up as well with our own Elastic Sky playing for the uh, reception. So immediately afterwards, we'll all go join this, the uh, welcome reception. Now one thing I want to continue to stress is that a great way to continue the collaboration in the community, the sharing of best practices, to have dialogue with peers is through our VMware user group. VMUG, as we like to call it, is now 60,000 strong, stretching across the globe. There's a booth in the Solutions Exchange area for you to be able to go and sign up and find a local group in order to join and participate. And I'd actually like to take one minute here and recognize the VMUG Board of Directors and all of the VMUG leaders around the world who take time out of their own personal life to run those community meetings and sessions and make it all happen. So if you're a VMUG leader, can you please stand up for one moment? I'd like to give you a big round of applause. We thank you for your commitment to the community. It's never too early to plan ahead. VMworld 2012, back in San Francisco, because quite frankly, as we keep growing year after year after year, this is the largest amount we can fit here in Vegas. So we're going back to San Francisco, August 27th through 30th. Make sure it's on your calendar. So at this point, it is with great pleasure that I get to introduce to you our CEO, Mr. Paul Moritz. There you go. Well, good afternoon and welcome. And I would particularly like to say thank you to all of you who are attending here this afternoon, particularly uh, to those who braved Mother Nature on the East Coast and still managed to, to make it here today. Last year, when uh, I presented to you, uh, we started off with a slide that uh, basically made the point that according to the industry analysts, to the end of 2009, was the period in which there were more new server applications being deployed on virtualized infrastructure than there were server applications being deployed on physical infrastructure. So that was a statement about new applications. This year, the same industry analysts are telling us that we've just gone through the threshold of where it's not only new server applications, but in fact the entire installed base of server applications has now reached the point where there are more server applications running on virtualized infrastructure than on physical infrastructure. This is an amazing milestone for our industry. Anytime you can get 
a platform that's carrying more than half of anything, uh, that has usually very important implications for the industry. And, and before I start going through some of those implications, sir, uh, I do want to acknowledge that it has been a joint journey. And we've reached this point through the efforts of most of you in this audience. And uh, we asked our data people to try and characterize what it means to have more than half of the world's server applications on virtualized infrastructure. And uh, they came up with these statistics. Uh, it means that a new VM uh, is being born every six seconds, which apparently is more than uh, physical babies in the United States. It means that there are now more than 20 million virtual machines ticking away uh, around the globe. And if you look at uh, our signature feature, vMotion, it means that uh, at any point in time, there are actually more virtual machines in flight <laughs> than there are actually aircraft in flight. Uh, so obviously, we couldn't have really achieved this without the contribution of many very important people, starting with uh, the VMware admins themselves. And uh, we're getting close up towards having a million people around the, the world who have on their job description that they administer this virtual environment. Uh, within that, we have a very important community of people, the VMware certified prof professionals. We now have VMware certified professionals in 146 countries. Uh, I, we weren't able to actually get the list of the countries that we don't have VMware certified professionals in, uh, but I'm, with the exception of uh, North Korea, I think we've hit all of the larger countries in the world. And lastly, we've done that in conjunction with the application vendors, uh, because at the end of the day, infrastructure is a means towards an end to run applications. and. Uh, we now have over 3,000 ISV applications that are certified on VMware infrastructure. So a great achievement for us all collectively. The question then becomes, this is where do we go from here? And uh, as you can probably notice from our signage uh, at this event, we at VMware are not immune from cloud fever. Uh, you know, we also tend to use this word a lot. And it's worth actually taking a, some time to say, what is really profound about the cloud era? Is it really just about timeshare rediscovered? Or is it really just about another passing fad in our industry? Or are there actually more profound forces at work? And I actually do believe that the cloud era is about three very profound things. And I'll try and uh, outline those to you uh, in a moment. But above all, what this cloud era represents is the next major interaction between the consumerization of IT on the one hand and traditional enterprise IT on the other. And these two forces are working with each other, and out of this will come a new synthesis uh, that will really redefine IT over the coming decade. And I'll, in a moment, try and outline to you uh, some details behind that. But the question then becomes, obviously, how do we collectively transition between these eras? How do we go into the cloud era in a smart and orderly way? And how do we free up the time and effort and funds to be able to do that? Now. When you're like me, and you're on the far side of the age 50, uh, and you've had 30 years in the industry, one of the privileges that you get is you're allowed to bore people with history lessons. <laughs> and I'm going to indulge in a very short history lesson today. I started my working career uh, in London, England in 1978. I was a newly minted computer science graduate, and th th those days that was a big thing because I think there had only been two or three years of computer science graduates at that point in time. And I showed up in London, England, and tried to get a job uh, at a mainframe company. A and basically I was turned down by uh, IBM, uh, I was turned down by a couple of others, 
And finally, I got a job uh, at a company called Burroughs. And uh, rather than letting me work on Big Iron, which is what I thought I was going to do, uh, they gave me the job of debugging the software in a 12-bit microprocessor that was controlling the printer in the world's first ATM machine. <laughs> A big come down if you're an aspiring computer science graduate. It turned out to be a blessing in disguise because it took me uh, into the next generation. Instead of being trapped in that generation, I actually got uh, caught up in the client server generation. But the key thing that I want to talk about in these generations is one of the ways that you can characterize a generation of technology is by the canonical applications. And the canonical applications of the mainframe era were really about automated bookkeeping. Uh, you probably remember back in those days that typically the CIO reported to the CFO. And that was because the key applications that were being run were essentially glorified bookkeeping applications. And those applications were developed on underlying data structures like ISAMs, et cetera. And then an interesting thing started to happen, which is uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, we first saw the first interaction between a new source of computing, the consumer world. Over the 90s and into the 2000s, we saw hundreds of millions of new users encounter computing, mainly through personal computers, PCs. And out of that came a new set of technologies out of that era, we got the graphical user interface. We got new programming paradigms like C++. Uh, we got new silicon standards like the Intel architecture that, because they had scale, grew to have a very profound thing, influence on how things were happening inside the enterprise. And it was in that time frame that we got a new data fabric. Uh, we got the relational database. And on that data fabric, we were able to build a new set of canonical applications uh, that characterized that environment. And we stood in there the influence that came into the client-server envir environment from the web, IP networks, again, uh, new programming paradigms like Java and HTML. And with that, we got these canonical applications such as CRM, such as e-commerce, such as integrated ERP systems. Uh, and we got non-real-time analytics, the ability to build data warehouses and go back and find out what had happened in the past and be informed by that. Now, I believe that actually the important thing about the cloud is we're going to see another and even bigger round of interaction between a big pool of computing coming out of the consumer space with new techniques, new approaches, affecting what happens in the enterprise space, giving rise to a new set of canonical applications. And when the canonical applications change, that's when you get really profound change in everything in the computer industry. So what we're seeing in the cloud era is not just hundreds of millions, but millions of new users and devices now coming into play. Three years ago, over 95% of the devices connected to the internet were personal computers. Three years from now, that number will probably be less than 20%. More than 80% of the devices connected to the, uh, to the internet will not be Windows-based personal computers. With that kind of scale, we're going to have to see new techniques and new approaches introduced into the uh, era, into the world of IT. We're going to see very important new ways of presenting and developing applications. HTML5 promises to be very, very important because it could be a genuinely capable cross-device way of, running of writing applications. We're already seeing the influence of new programming frameworks that I'll come back to. We're seeing new ways of deploying applications in, as a service, whether it be infrastructure as a service or platform as a service. And above all, we're seeing new data fabrics. The relational database cannot handle the scale at which and the rate at which these applications are going to be uh, needed to be developed. And out of this, you can already start to see the beginnings of the next canonical set of applications that will be 
about scale and being real time. It's no longer going to be su sufficient to be able to collect data, put it into a giant warehouse, let it lie fallow there, and then run a report over it to find out what happened last month or the month before that. People are going to have to be able to react to information coming in in real time. If you're going to service the Facebook generation the way that they want to see information, you're going to have to be able to give them customized information in the context that they want to see it in real time. And this is going to be behind fundamental changes in business processes which will drive through this new applications that will in turn have a profound impact uh, in terms of how everything is put together inside IT. Now, the question is, is how do we go forward from here? And uh, I think we're now going to see an even more determined effort to basically say, let's ring fence off the mainframes. <laughs> let's realize that they have some important applications on them, but essentially they're going to have to be put into a corner. And the question really becomes, how do we take the much bigger legacy now that sits in the client server world, which is too big for us to walk away from, and how do we migrate from there into this emerging cloud era? So we're going to have to deal with three forces, as I said earlier. The first force is how do we make it fundamentally more efficient to be able to run those, that subset of the client server era applications that we can't walk away from and we have to keep going for some time. But we're going to have to run them fundamentally more efficiently because we're going to need to free up the time and effort and money to really tackle the profound problem, which is the renewal of applications. We're going from an era where applications, by and large, were really written for non-real-time operation, for a world of paper, where you communicated the results to users either through real paper or through virtualized paper on the screen, to a world where we're going to have to basically, as I said, above all, respond in real time. That can't be done by putting more lipstick around our existing applications. They are going to, we're going to have to go over the coming decade through fundamental application renewal in order to be able to service business needs in the future. That's the second major force. The third major force is, is that users are expecting to see that information on a much broader class of devices and in different ways. So we're no longer going to be able to depend upon the fact that IT can control the device in a user's hands. The device in the user's hands is going to be fundamentally determined by what happens in the consumer world. And we're going to have to learn how to de deliver capability to users independent of the particular device that they happen to have in their hands at that time of day and do that in a way that's not only secure on the one hand but acceptable to the user on the other. They're not going to put up with strange effects of basically having legacy paradigms are sitting on these new devices that they like and are very productive using. So a big challenge then as to how we bridge from the existing world of the way that we do end user provisioning to the future. And it's our collective ability to navigate these three forces that's really going to determine our success. Uh, history teaches us when you have three important forces like this operating, that at the end of the day, the change that they bring around is very profound. And out of this space will come winners and losers. And we at VMware are very conscious of this. I remember that I started working for a company called Burroughs that no longer exists. Uh, and we need to be very smart and pragmatic about how we set about this journey. So what we're doing is really trying to provide solutions that would allow our customers to make orderly a pro progress in each of these three dimensions. The first in, uh, dimension then is how do we allow infrastructure renewal? Because we're not going to be able to rewrite all of those client server applications overnight. Those client server applications are going to have to be with us for a very long time, and you have to essentially work underneath those applications. 
We have to slide new functionality in, the, uh, in underneath them and then slide the applications themselves around to get that level of operational efficiency. Now, virtualization is a critical technology for doing that. One of the reasons why virtualization has been so successful is it can be applied in a non-disruptive way to existing applications. So this journey definitely starts with virtualization. The next leg of the journey has to be about operational efficiency. How do we become fundamentally more efficient at running infrastructure? And we use as a shorthand for that cloud operations. This has to be about automation. If we're going to essentially just create more management tasks and different management tasks, we're never going to get the operational efficiency that will allow us to free up the time and energy and funds to go after application renewal. So what we are working on at VMware is trying to take that reservoir, that foundation of virtualization that we've built up, which has been largely to date driven by hardware efficiency, making hardware more efficient, to turn that into operational efficiency going forward. And I'm going to run through very quickly the things that we are doing uh, to enable that. One of the things we're doing is trying to create not just a hypervisor, not just basically the control functions of the hypervisor, but in fact now a complete suite that can address infrastructure operations. Infrastructure at the end of the day is not interesting to businesses. It's something like plumbing in your house. You have to have it. If it goes wrong, it's a big problem. <laughs> but you really want to be able to forget about it. And that requires an integrated solution. So we're going to set about putting in place the pieces to allow our customers to have access to an integrated suite for all of the aspects of operating infrastructure. That is clearly lies on the foundation of vSphere itself. Now, I've been in the fortunate position for the last two year, three years to be able to announce at each VMworld a new version of vSphere. Uh, back in 2009, uh, we delivered vSphere 4.0, which is a big step forward for us. Key theme was improving performance and scale. Uh, we improved resiliency. We started to address the coordination of other functions, not just compute, with the introduction of the vir first distributed virtual s switch. Then in 4.1 last, uh, uh, last year, in 2010, we continued to, again, to continue to mine performance and scale, uh, started to add functions to allow you to basically automatically uh, manage the scheduling and uh, movement of workloads, in particular making it possible to address what's known as the noisy neighbor problem, where you have one virtual machine that's hogging all the resources on one, one physical host and being able to move it around to prevent basically uh, people being unfairly throttled. This year, I'm very happy to say that we're now, we've in the position of delivering to you vSphere 5.0. Now, this has been a major achievement for our development team because to do this predictably every year requires you to have overlapping development efforts. Uh, so while doing this, our team has put into 5.0 over a million man hours of engineering, over 2 million man hours of Q&A. And that's the reason because this kind of software has to become just like hardware. If we're going to make infrastructure uninteresting, where you can just put it in and it works, you've got to make damn sure that it's at very high quality. And we're not only doing that uh, in our own software, but we've got to do it in conjunction with a very large ecosystem at this point in time. There are over 2,000 different configurations that we had to go through during those 2 million hour QA hours that we delivered. So it's an enormous achievement by uh, our team uh, to be able to pull off this achievement of being able to ship releases predictably and have overlapping development. In fact, I've been in this industry for 30 years, and uh, vSphere 5.0 is the first major system software release that I've been associated with that went out basically on schedule with the original functionality spec for it. 
I feel like I can die now. I've seen it once in my lifetime. <laughs> the, what all that effort has delivered is continuing to lead the march towards allowing virtualization to become the true substrate for all computing. And not only be that substrate, but be the automated substrate on which many applications sit. So we've continued to work again on performance and scale, getting it to the point now where we can handle what we call euphemistically monster VMs, so that you can have a virtual machine that gets into the terabyte range in terms of the memory allocated to it. Uh, 32 virtual CPUs per virtual machine. You also see us now starting to work on the automation aspects. In particular, we've returned our attention to the automation of the management of storage. Because it turns out that one of the biggest drivers of cost in data centers is trying to correlate the management of your compute loads on the one hand with the management of your storage loads on the other, because they both have to come together to deliver an effective SLA for that application. So you see us now starting to deliberately move down that road of putting in place the, the facilities that allow us to work very closely with the storage industry to make sure that we can present up to the application a unified view of compute and storage. So many features in vSphere 5 now that speak to storage management, you can see, expect to see us continue that. The result is greater scale. Uh, we believe at this point now that there are almost no applications that we can't scale to handle. Greater resiliency and greater automation, which should mean more apps on this platform, more efficient operate, uh, operating of those apps, and more mission critical applications. Now, I mentioned earlier that we're not just trying to work on the vSphere layer, which is the layer that allows you to pool together your compute and your storage and your networking elements, but we're trying to provide a suite of products that not only allow you to do that, but allow you to effectively manage and work with uh, this new foundation. So we are declaring that from this point onwards, we're going to be supplying vSphere as part of a larger suite of products that will be increasingly coordinated, put out on a common schedule, tested together, et cetera, to allow to our customers to have access to the infrastructure necessary for the private and hybrid cloud environment. So if you look at our product line now, what you will see is not just vSphere, but basically all of the key elements that we need to instantiate that suite. The software to do the security and endpoint functions. The software to do the basic management and monitoring of this large pool of computing that you're creating. The software to allow you to do business continuity, disaster recovery across uh, data centers. And the software that allows you to associate policy to those applications and present a self-service uh, user interface to the customers of infrastructure. So one of the key themes that you can see going forward is, is we will be moving to coordinate these releases and get them out on a common schedule tested together. And over the next month or two, we will be releasing new versions of all of these products. And you can see we are mo moving to aligning the sequence numbers so hopefully by this time next year, you will see us on version 5.1 of every one of these products put out together as a suite. One of the things we're also trying to do is to allow you to not only implement a private cloud, but tap into resources that you can rent out of our service provider community. This is something we started a couple of years ago. We continue to work on that and continue to see significant success in that space. Uh, so at this point in time, uh, we have many, many uh, uh, providers who are using our software to operate different kinds of services, but in particular, we have nearly 50 uh, service providers now who are committed to provide not just vSphere, but the vCloud director product that sits on top of vSphere and prevents that user interface to the infrastructure. We're also starting to see and very welcome to see people taking this technology and applying it to vertical clouds. In particular, we have the New York Stock Exchange that will be using this technology to build a cloud dedicated to the financial services industry. 
Uh, we have Harris, who's going to do the same thing for a cloud dedicated to the healthcare space. And in addition to that, if you look at the entire range of products that we have in that suite, we have also created another tier of partners that we call our vCloud data center partners that are committed to put the full suite uh, into their clouds. And uh, we started the kicked off this program uh, at VMworld last year. Uh, since then, we've added SoftBank in Japan as a partner here, and uh, recently announced that we're adding Dell as a partner. An interesting development in this space is a subset of these service providers have decided to club together to be able to pre present a virtual worldwide global cloud called Global Connect. So uh, Singtel and uh, SoftBank and BlueLock are getting together to basically allow you to have a common experience of their cloud. So if you're a global company and want to get cloud resources literally around the world, you'll be able to go and work with that consortium of companies who will give you that capability. Now I want to go from one extreme to the other because uh, we have to remember that uh, over half of the world's IT budget is actually spent, spent by small and medium-sized businesses. So what are we doing for our customers at that space? Uh, we have two product lines that we're working on there, one of which you probably know about, one of which might be new to you. One is vSphere Essentials, and the other is VMware Go. vSphere Essentials is about essentially creating a data center in a box. So how do we put together all the software that will allow a small and medium-sized business to be able to take two, three, four servers and put them together and treat them as a fully uh, reliable, redundant, fault-tolerant uh, uh, system? Now, Many of our advanced features that provide the resiliency require common storage between uh, the compute elements. So if you're going to do vMotion, if you're going to do HA, if you're going to do fault tolerance, et cetera, you have to have a SAN in the picture, which is a significant uh, step up for a small business to deal with. So we have recently introduced our first virtual storage appliance that is targeted at the small end of the market, allows you to take three standard servers, essentially drop our software into it. It's designed to be dead simple to use. Uh, basically, an install button, and that's it. It finds the local direct attached storage of those servers and sets up what looks like a virtual SAN uh, for those servers to do. And now, at that level, you have full access to our advanced features for resiliency purposes. VMware Go is something that grew out of their the fact that, uh, as many of you know, we do have a free hypervisor product, ESXi. And about 400,000 people a year were downloading ESXi. And uh, somebody observed that they must be downloading it for a purpose. Very few people download a hypervisor just for the fun of it. Uh, so we decided to try and find a way of adding value to what those people were trying to achieve. And we launched a service over a year ago called VMware Go, which is actually a SaaS-based service uh, that allows or offers to people assistance to get the hypervisor and whatever other solution they're trying to put it, put, put it uh, on top of it set up. Uh, that has become very successful. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of people now using that service. So we're starting to extend the set of capabilities that we can offer to those people. The next step has been essentially doing asset uh, management and patch management for those customers. So it's our basically trying to work our SMB customers, small and medium-sized business customers, down the hybrid cloud route in a different way at the level of functionality that makes sense to them. The big challenge, as I said, for our industry, the second major force that's going to operate over the coming decade is application renewal. Uh, we're going to have to find ways of enabling this new canonical set of applications. And these applications, I'm sorry to say for myself, are largely going to be written by people under the age of 35. So we need to look very carefully at what young developers are doing. The analogy here is, is that if in 1990 you were hiring a young programmer and uh, you welcomed him into your environment and you said, Welcome, son. Here's this COBOL Bible. Please go and read it. Uh, they would look at you with horror and probably run. 
Today, if you hire a young programmer and you say, welcome, here's the EJB Bible, please go read it, uh, they'll probably look at you with horror as well. There has been a developer-led revolution over the last five to eight years where developers have kind of revolted against complexity and taken matters into their own hands and have come up with ways of dealing with that complexity, which is largely encapsulated in these new programming frameworks and new fabrics. So we need to look at what the new generation of programmers are doing and make sure that we are putting in place the capabilities that they will expect to see in place so that as we go forward, we can give them those capabilities, ideally on the same underlying infrastructure substrate, so that we can blend in these new applications from an operational perspective as we go forward. A lot of these developers want to operate at a fundamentally higher level. They, are no, they don't have any tolerance for basically dealing with the underlying details, and that's encapsulated in what's called platform as a service, where developers are willing to give up control over the low-level details in return for being able to deploy their applications much more quickly, have a lot of the housekeeping issues such as scaling taken care of them. So we've started to make investments to address these uh, important trends. And uh, the frameworks and the middleware and the new data fabrics we put under a label we call vFabric. vFabric has two important elements to it. On the one hand, it keys off the Spring fra pra programming framework, which in some ways is uh, the most sophisticated of these frameworks targeted at the enterprise environment. Uh, and it also now increasingly starts to speak to data. So we had already put in place investments that we made through acquisition around a company called Gem with their Gemfire product. And uh, this is a very high scale in-memory data fabric. You can think of this as a scale-out in-memory database. They've been very successful there. It sits underneath some of the most demanding applications in the world. Uh, the Gemfire product, for instance, sits underneath the program that the US Department of Defense uses to track every single mobile asset uh, in, their, in their enemy's inventory. Uh, so it takes 60,000 updates a second, three times more than the Visa network takes. And it basically tracks the real-time status of, for instance, any aircraft in flight. It allows a commander to drill in and find out how much fuel that plane has in its left fuel tank. We're now starting to make that available to a broader programming community with the recent introduction of SQL Fire, which tries to marry the extraordinary scalability of the Gemfire product with a much easier programming model uh, which keys off uh, the SQL programming language. We're also now at this event announcing something we call Data Director. Now what we've observed is, is that one of the tasks uh, for enterprises is not only to manage the low level infrastructure but to manage the big sprawl of databases that they have sitting under many of these client server applications in their test dev environment, et cetera. And a lot of effort, just like a lot of effort goes into managing low level storage, a lot of effort goes into managing and provisioning databases. So how can we start to make that much easier to do? So we're introducing a product we call vFabric Data Director that is aware of vSphere and makes it much easier to basically set up and manage databases, to do the backup, the cloning, et cetera, of databases. Into that uh, data director, as a first example of a data store that takes advantage, advantage of it, we're announcing a vFabric vSphere optimized version of Postgres. So we've taken the standard Postgres product and we've enhanced its capability to do orderly memory management on a virtualized infrastructure. What that means is you'll get much higher densities of databases per unit infrastructure. This is something we would like all database vendors to take advantage of. Uh, so this is something that uh, anyone can plug into. Uh, the changes to Postgres we're providing back to the open source community. So if you want to see how to optimize memory management in a database on virtualized infrastructure, you can do that. And we hope many more vendors will do this. In fact, Sybase uh, just also announced that they will be working on a vSphere 
virtualization optimized version uh, of the Sybase database. The third leg of addressing application renewal is to speak to programming platform as a service. Our effort there, which we announced early this year, is called Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry is really about how applications will be written in the future. Uh, it's an interesting piece of software because it is open in many dimensions. First of all, it's open in terms of the programming frameworks that it can so, uh, support. So it is open in terms of these modern programming frameworks. This is really trying to speak to how the new generation of developers want to work. Uh, we released it in its first incarnation with uh, support for the Spring programming framework, uh, framework for the Ruby family uh, and for the Node.js framework. Now, we released Cloud Foundry as an open source product. Uh, it's available under an Apache 2 license, uh, and the source code is there. You can go to cloudfoundry.org and find it and download it and work with it. And uh, we've started to see the community, the open source community, start to add to this framework. For instance, we've seen support for the Scala programming uh, system added uh, to Cloud Foundry. It's also open in that you provides another set of interfaces that you can plug both existing and future services into and make them available to people using those programming frameworks. So it has a set of interfaces that allow you to plug in database services, queuing services, new data fabrics, et cetera. In addition, it's designed to be portable across clouds. You heard me say earlier that at the infrastructure level, the kind of software that we're writing down there needs to become like hardware. It just needs to be something that works. If you go back to the client-server era, basically Linux came about as a way of ensuring that applications didn't get too tightly bound to one particular hardware architecture. So if you wrote a Linux or a Unix application, you had a better rather than a lesser chance of being able to port uh, that application from an Intel architecture to a RISC architecture, et cetera. Now, in this cloud-based world, there's a real danger that we might go back, actually, to how things were in the mini-computer and mainframe days, which is where, once you wrote an application, you had one place to deploy it or one kind of system that you could deploy it on, and that was it. If you wrote it for the IBM environment, you were stuck there. If you wrote it for the VAX VMS environment, you were stuck there. We don't believe that the cloud environment should be like that. And in fact, we don't believe that the open source community would stand for that. So the question becomes, if infrastructure is becoming the new hardware, what will be the new cloaking layer? What will be, using the term very loosely, the new Linux? And uh, we believe that that layer would come about. And rather than sit back and wait for it to happen, we decided to make a contribution in that space and to do it in an open way, fully realizing that that would mean that this new layer would be available not only on vSphere-based infrastructure, but potentially on other infrastructures as well. But if that's where history is going to take us, let's get there first and be able to, to uh, influence that and play a constructive role there. So we've made the software available. We have it instantiated right now as cloudfoundry.com which is an instantiation on top of vSphere infrastructure, actually running uh, a couple of miles from here uh, in the SwitchNAP data center here in Las Vegas. Uh, but we fully expect that uh, layer of software to be available on other infrastructure clouds as well. One very important example of a uh, type of infrastructure that we want to see Cloud Foundry on is the developer's workstation on your laptop. So the other thing that we have recently uh, put into beta test is something we call the microcloud, which is a fully functional version of Cloud Foundry uh, on a memory stick. Here's one here uh, that you can push into your laptop. And a few minutes later, you will have a fully functioning version with all the APIs and services of Cloud Foundry available to you as a developer. You can use that as your own private, private cloud and develop applications there and then upload them uh, into whatever cloud uh, instance of Cloud Foundry you would like to in the future. 
Lastly, this, uh, the third key force that we're going to have to deal with is a new way of making information and applications available to the end user. Uh, Steve Jobs likes to say that we're entering into the post-PC era, and we agree with that. But there are still hundreds of millions uh, of PC users, and we need to do a better job of allowing those people to get access uh, to the applications that they need. So we continue to be investing very heavily in our VIEW desktop virtualization product. And we're also announcing at this event uh, VIEW 5.0. Uh, we've done a lot of work in VIEW to basically address the entire list uh, of customer concerns uh, which we've heard from our customers. Uh, so we've seen significant bandwidth improvements. VIEW 5 should work in high latency and low bandwidth environments significantly better than its pre predecessor did. Uh, we've addressed the need for client ubiquity, so we will have view clients available for almost any, every device that you can think of. And integration with providers of uh, voice over IP and unified communication. So very big step forward with View 5.0. And when you marry that with the work that we're doing in the underlying engine, the underlying uh, infrastructure automation engine and the scale improvements that we've been making there, we believe that the combination of vSphere plus View 5.0 will hands down give the industry's most scalable and cost-effective desktop virtualization solution. Now the challenge becomes is PCs are not the only animal in the zoo anymore. <laughs> they are increasingly users are holding other devices in their hands. And in many cases, they're not even devices owned by uh, the enterprise. And uh, as a result, we have to realize that some important things have to happen. In the last 10 or 15 years, the Windows desktop has played two roles. Uh, on the one hand, it's been the interface to Windows. On the other hand, it's been the mechanism by which IT controlled and provided capabilities to a user. That's where applications were installed. That's where files were dropped on the desktop. That's where menus were turned on and off, et cetera. In a post-PC world, that second aspect of the desktop can't belong to any one device or even any one operating system. So we have to float away that other aspect of the desktop and find a different solution for that. And we started down that journey with the introduction of a set of technologies that will share the name Horizon. Horizon is about our attempt, and the desktop probably isn't the right phrase here, but to create this new capability to allow IT to provision people with capabilities, associate applications to people, and associate information to people, and not to devices. And uh, we're now moving down that road uh, with Horizon. The second challenge becomes is how do you appropriately, once the user does touch a physical device, how do you take their environment and in an appropriate way map that environment to the device? And because there are going to be many different devices, we're going to have to use a collection of different approaches uh, to make it a satisfactory experience for the user when that happens. So you'll see us doing different things in this era. One of the interesting things we're working on there, as Steve will demonstrate tomorrow, is what do you do on a phone? And what we'll do on the phone, one of the techniques we'll use is a virtual phone, basically allowing you to have two phones uh, in one physical phone. So what the enterprise will do is equip their users with a virtual phone, and then whatever phone the user has, that virtual phone will live in the same phone, same physical phone, but it will be walled off from the user's personal environment. Uh, so there will be a set of capabilities associated with your work phone that will be controlled by IT, and then you can, as a end as a consumer, can do whatever you want in your personal phone. So if you live in a risky way and download a hacked version of Andri uh, Angry Birds, uh, that hacked version isn't going to read the corporate address book and transmit it to the ba bad guys wherever they may be. This is one of the types of techniques that we're going to have to use in this environment. Right now, uh, we're ex putting that into trial uh, with, uh, on Android-based devices. And Steve will cover this and more uh, tomorrow morning. Lastly, uh, we're realizing that 
what you do on these new devices is not the same as what you do on the old PC. Uh, I've spent most of my working life basically on the PC generation. And the PC generation was really about, the vision there was about how did we, how could we automate the life of a white collar worker circa 1975. So Xerox PARC with their pioneering work that was then picked up by Apple and Microsoft was really about looking at a white collar worker behind a desk that had a desktop and files and folders and drawers and, and an inbox and an outbox and a typewriter on it and saying, how do we automate that? And it was an incredibly successful journey. For 20 years, we worked on at the point where we could really cre create great people a great desktop environment in that sense. The problem is, is that people under the age of 35 don't sit behind desks, and they don't spend all of their time lovingly tending to a few tens or hundreds of documents. We're moving into a new post-document era. And we have to realize that we need different solutions. Just like we need different solutions for programmers under the age 35, we're getting a different set of solutions for people who are coming out of a diff very different way of experiencing and working with information. They're not going to spend all of their time lovingly preparing documents. They're going to deal with streams of information that are coming at them in much smaller chunks, much larger numbers. And it's all going to be how do you filter and organize and enable that. So we have started to make uh, some investments in addition to Horizon around a set of applications for this post-PC, post-document world. So what we're trying to do then as a company is work our way through those three major forces. Uh, at the infrastructure level, which is the heart of our company, where most of our effort is, it's about how do we give you an integrated suite down there and how do we extend that appropriately into the hybrid Clive environment for both large companies and small companies. It's about trying to think about the next generation of developers and the next generation of canonical applications. That's what we're doing with vFabric and Cloud Foundry. And then thirdly, it's about how do we deal with the next generation of users and their needs. And in each three cases, how do we map from where we are in the client server generation into the cloud generation. So when you go back to uh, the fact that we've got 50% uh, of the world's server applications running uh, on, night on virtualized infrastructure today, the question becomes, obviously, what about the next 50%? <laughs> uh, so what we need to do is to enable that 50% that's largely being driven by the influence of IT to now be complemented by the other 50%, which has to encompass not only tier two and tier three applications, but mission critical applications. So the first next step is basically tackling mission critical applications. And that's what we have been working very hard on in vSphere 5 in the cloud infrastructure suite. And then the step beyond that is how do we add in operational efficiency, automation, application renewal, and provisioning uh, to users in a multi-device post-PC world, which we put the label IT as a service on. So we believe that this is the journey that we're trying to walk towards giving our customers an evolutionary path towards control, agility, and choice. Now, instead of talking about this as a theory, uh, what I'd like to do now is to invite Carl Eschenbach, who's our president of uh, customer operations, to come up here and uh, three customers have been kind enough to join him to talk about this uh, journey in concrete terms. Carl. Hey, Carl. Thank you, Paul. You. Appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. So you've just heard from Paul Moritz talking about bridging the gap. And what we're talking about is bridging the gap around the challenges we're faced with in IT today. And those challenges are in some terms daunting and sometimes very challenging for us to figure out what to do next to go from the current way of delivering IT services to the new cloud era. And one of the biggest challenges we have collectively is how do we protect and leverage the current set of assets we all have in IT today. 
because the fact is there is literally billions of dollars that you have all invested in your infrastructure. And that infrastructure supports a significant number of legacy applications. And those legacy applications today are still driving and running the business. But we know with cloud computing, there is a new way to deliver IT services. And cloud is no longer an if, it's a when and how fast can we move toward cloud adoption. That's our challenge. That's what we have to do. And as IT leaders, as you sit here today, you have the opportunity to leverage cloud computing to help transform the business and allow IT to become a strategic asset and no longer viewed as a cost center. And Paul talked about the fact that VMware is very well positioned to help our customers go on a guided journey to cloud computing. And that's not easy to do. But thanks to you, our growing community of customers, partners, and developers, you've already started to trust VMware on this journey. Together, the journey's begun. It's begun with virtualization. And virtualization is the underpinning to all clouds. In fact, x86 virtualization is the underpinning to all clouds. So collectively, the journey's begun but we still have a ways to go. And we're not gonna stop at infrastructure as Paul so clearly articulated. We're gonna move up the stack and we're gonna leverage the highly virtualized infrastructure and cloud infrastructure to deliver a new development framework that is lighter, faster, and providing business agility. And lastly, we're gonna leverage that same infrastructure to provide a seamless integration with the next generation of desktops, which does not include the PC. So collectively, we have a significant opportunity. And today, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring up three different IT executives from some of our most valued customers. And they're gonna talk about their own journey that they've already started to go on to provide cloud services for their companies. And they're solving really mission critical business challenges by leveraging IT. And they are no longer thought of as a bottleneck, but they're thought of as, business, as a business enhancer. With that being said, I'd like to introduce our first customer. Our first customer is a leading global operator of financial markets and a provider of innovative trading platforms. The company's exchanges, both here in the US and in Europe, provides trades around equity, futures, options, fixed income, and exchange-traded platforms. Their technology division, NYSE Technologies, provides some of the most mission-critical applications for some of the largest financial institutions in the world. And they also provide exchange platforms for those financial institutions at the same time. It gives me great pleasure to introduce via video NYSE Euronex. Cloud computing is not a necessarily new concept. Ours is very much focused on the needs of the capital markets community. We support exchanges and clients all around the world, and that means that none of us ever sleep. It means that we've got to solve different clients, different, different cultures, different ways of doing things, different regulatory structures. It's different and yet the same. And our job is to try to find solutions that really work for all of those. We want to be more secure because we need to be, because our customers demand it. We need to be more reliable. We need to have higher performance in our systems because performance is extremely important in our industry. Across our portfolio, we have you know over a thousand clients, so uh, about six, seven hundred buy side firms, and, uh, and the equivalent on the sell side. It's clear that in order to solve these technology issues or address them, because we are pushing the technology envelope in almost everything we're doing. We have to be very selective and careful about who we work with to make sure that everyone's getting the most value for this. And that's one of the reasons we chose VMware to work with us because of their advanced technology record, their advanced thinking in these uh, fields in terms of cloud computing. They're the obvious choice for being a, a very specific partner, a very special partner to work with us on these issues. 
Our first guest is responsible for navigating IT for a company where daily transactions are measured in the billions. Capital value is measured in the trillions. And response time is literally measured in the millionths of a second. In this 400-year-old organization, Steve and his team are also taking the responsibility for not only servicing NYSC Euronex, but also turning and leveraging that same platform to provide new cloud services to the capital market. Folks, it gives me great pleasure to introduce on stage this uh, Executive Vice President and CIO of NYSC Euronex, Mr. Steve Rubinow. Hey, Hi, Carl. Steve, welcome. Hello, huh? I love the t-shirt. Hey, I feel like Paul McCartney at Wrigley Field. This is great. Uh, that's great. So, Steve, can you share a little bit more about NYSE Euronex and the role it plays in the capital markets, and for that matter, actually in our overall economy? Sure. Most people don't recognize, when they think of the name NYSE, they think of that iconic image on Wall Street with the, the pillars and the big American flag, and they think of the trading floor that they see on the news all day during the trading day. But it is so much more than that, Carl, some of which you've alluded to. We have multiple exchanges in the United States and in Europe, multiple asset classes, stocks, bonds, derivatives. And we have two brand new data centers, one in Europe, one in the United States, which are not only to service the, the needs of the global economy, as you say, to provide liquidity to the capital markets to make them work more efficiently, but also, as excitingly, most of the space in our new data centers is for our customers rather than for us, for our commercial technology division in part, which we'll talk more about in a bit. That's great. So, Steve, what does the, the technology infrastructure play as far as a role in the broader NYSE technology strategy? Well, you know, it was uh, only a few years ago that we started to rethink what we were as a company. And today, we're more apt to describe ourselves as a technology firm that operates exchanges rather than an exchange firm that happens to use technology. And that's because most trades in the world are server-to-server -server trades. It's not necessarily a person standing at a keyboard and typing. And in order to do that, and to do that in a competitive fashion, when you've got billions of transactions a day, and that's a six and a half hour trading day, not a 24 hour trading day, so it's a little bit more compressed. Mm -hmm. And when you've got security concerns and reliability concerns, and things have to take place in a millionth of a second, and they have to take place that way all day long, the technology that you use has to be first rate, and in many cases, we're inventing it ourselves because we have nowhere else to go for it. Now, Steve, today I think you have roughly 2,300 VMs running on your private cloud. Um, what technologies and products and solutions are you using and leveraging from VMware? So we use a whole host of uh, products from VMware. Obviously, we would use vSphere, but we also use vCenter Chargeback, vShield, vCloud Director. And again, I have to emphasize, we use it for ourselves to service our own business, and we also offer a whole host of service and services and products for our customers to come use within our data center, to use from outside of our data center, coming into our data center, to support the needs of the capital markets community for which we've designed a private cloud specifically for their needs. Gotcha. Steve, now a lot of people don't believe that they can run, if you will, high, you know, high latency, I'm sorry, low latency, high frequently traded applications on top of a vSphere platform. So how do you actually use VMware in your infrastructure and what part of the application stack is it taking advantage of? Well, I, I like to divide our application portfolio into two segments. Uh, one, and they're not equal segments, but one is the very latency sensitive segment. That's the microsecond, nanosecond range that we get really concerned about every tick of a clock. And for that, virtualization is a little bit too much overhead. However, if that's just the core of what we do, there's this whole sphere, not vSphere, but there's a whole sphere of applications outside of that without which you have no company, you have no exchange. And so much of that, things that happen after the trade happens, clearing, settlement, the data warehousing, surveillance, our own corporate systems, all of that is subject to virtualization and using the, the cloud technologies uh, to support that with virtualization. Thanks, Steve, for your initial thoughts. If you wouldn't mind having a seat, and I'll bring the other guests up. Steve Rubinow from NYSC Euronex. Our next customer is by far one of the strongest consumer brand franchises in the world. Founded in 1932, they operate and sell their products, beauty care products, in more than 100 countries in over six continents. Their vision is pretty straightforward. It's glamour, excitement, and innovation through high-quality products at very affordable prices. 
Let me bring to you now Revlon. Revlon has had our global cloud for the last two years in operations. What that cloud has delivered is a couple really key things. First is 6.9 uptime. So we just don't go down anymore. Second thing that we've delivered is savings and cost avoidance of $70.4 million. We watch everything, every penny we spend. And deploying the cloud has allowed us to avoid so much in infrastructure cost. The cloud almost runs itself. Our cloud makes 15,000 automated moves a month with no human intervention. We don't really have server people anymore. What used to take six or eight weeks to get a server in the data center, now is five minutes. Our ratio of physical server to you know, virtual server is one to seven. We're one to 34 this year. That's a 500% increase in capacity without cost. Uh, it gives us money to spend to develop the business and develop new products and advertise on TV. We've essentially taken the infrastructure out of the way of the business. VMware is our core. It is at the core of our cloud. It's really the center of the ecosystem of our partners. It allows us to be very fast. And simplicity equals speed. Speed equals competitive advantage. It's always on, it always works, it's always available, and it saved us a lot of money. Our chief function is really making systems work for people rather than people working for the systems. Our next guest is responsible for leveraging information technologies and services as a competitive weapon for the business. He and his teams, as you just heard from his statement up here, are focused on leveraging automation so that systems work for people, people don't work for systems. And one of the things I really love about David is he really pushes his team to build deep, meaningful trust and confidence between the line of business and the CIO in his organization. It gives me great pleasure to bring on stage Senior Vice President and CIO of Revlon, David Giambruno. David. Hi, David. Welcome. Well, thank you. Well, at a technology conference, I never get this opportunity, but since Paul said putting lipstick on your applications, if you need lipstick, I'm your guy. Okay? <laughs> Just getting that out there. Yeah. And what, what, it's funny, he says that one of his slogans when we were uh, you know, preparing for this event a couple weeks ago, he goes, we put the lipstick on the cloud. Because we do pretty cloud. <laughs> we have to. So, David, I've, I'm really interested in one of the you know, IT operating models that you focus on is simplicity. And in your, in your case, you call it one of faster, cheaper, better. Can you quantify faster, cheaper, better for the audience? So, you know, we started this in 2005. We, uh, we went live globally in 2008, and we really started counting. And, you know, we, some key metrics are simple, so, so faster. Our project throughput globally is up 300% in two years. We get more done for the business. Getting what they want, you want business alignment, do what they want and do it fast, right? Better, we're running six nines uptime, right? I mean, we're a manufacturing company and we can do that. Again, that's better, right? It lets us turn around and not watch, but turn forward and help the business to help them do more. Cheaper, in two years, we've given back or avoided $70.4 million. And that wasn't me counting, that was the finance department because my controller runs my life, right? We have a simple saying, follow the money. Right, and he follows every penny I spend. So David, that's a big number, $70 million of cost savings and cost avoidance. And as you said, I think the important point there is you didn't come up with this number, you worked with finance to determine the actual savings from your private cloud implementation. So one of the big sayings, and my team who's here will just, like, every time they hear it, they cringe, but it's trust but verify. And that's as well as the technology about how I run my department because it is all about trust. If you're gonna do these things and change the way you operate, you have to be trusted. If you're not, it just, you know, the challenges will come out of every corner. So it was really, I think, uh, a nice kudo back to, to my organization for the finance department to recognize what we were doing. We didn't ask them, they, they saw the changes that were happening and took it upon themselves to quantify it. And, you know, in the world we live on, you know, follow the money, 
you know, and value to our shareholders, that's really important to have the finance department come at you and support what you're doing. Yep. And, and they ended up being on our side. So as they saw the changes, it's like, not only are we running better, we're doing it cheaper. Yeah. And we're doing it better. And that's really a magical com combination. Now, David, since you've implemented your private cloud, um, no pun intended because we're here in Vegas, you've literally gone all in with VMware. And today, you have 98% of your applications and workload running on top of your private cloud. So one of my things, I always comment that we're like the southwest of airlines, right? We do this thing we call oneness. So we pick one thing and do, ver do it incredibly well. It's about that density of skill sets and capability. And so we literally picked up our application portfolio, 531 apps, and put them on our cloud. We ported things. We, it was really, you know, it's VMware running the you know, Microsoft Guest OS, and that's it. That's, you know, it was just about that focus and execution around that capability. So David, that, that literally means all of your mission critical tier one applications are on top of this cloud. And I think you only have two Unix servers left in your entire so, global infrastructure. So we have two Unix servers left and three AS400s. What used to, you know, we kind of effectually, you know, our data centers now are soccer field. I mean, one of the big benefits is also we've reduced our data center power by 72%. So, you know, we have corporate goals of greenness, um, but it, it really is that you know, total transformation and focus and execution. Yeah. Simplicity and wins. So David, you know, one of the things we talk to our customers about is the difference between being highly virtualized and actually the implementation of a private cloud. Since you're so highly virtualized, how do you actually measure the difference between that old environment and the private cloud deployment you have today? Um, I, I think of it in terms of geography. It was one of the things like data center in a box. It's probably because I have a three-year-old. We have lots of little isms. I, talk like I'm in uh, reading too much Dr. Seuss, but we have things called sand in a can and a drib, and these things are essentially geographic dispersed, and we move applications globally. So it's not about the virtualization, it's actually moving applications around the, the Revlon universe. Okay, great. I appreciate you sharing your initial thoughts. Why don't you join Steve on the panel, and I'll introduce our next guest here. Our next customer is operating an airline in its 40th year, and it continues to differentiate itself from other low-cost airline carriers by providing what we call a very reliable customer service-focused initiative. And if you've flown on this airline, folks, you know they focus on customer service. They operate more than 3,400 flights a day, making it the single largest US-based air carrier Folks, I'd like to introduce to you Southwest Airlines. Airline industry is a very tough industry. Airlines weren't built to run on $130 barrel fuel. So what VMware allows us to do is more effectively use our investment in both our applications, our hardware, and our people to be able to allow a seamless delivery of services for our applications 365 days a year. At Southwest Airlines, the communication department and our technology department work very closely together. In this day and age when people absorb most of their information from online sources, websites, blogs, things like that, uh, technology has become an incredible need for us. When we uh, took to the sky uh, 40 years ago, I don't think anyone would have ever had the vision that we would be using the cloud uh, to actually deliver our product, deliver information, and help us lower our cost. Well, our goal uh, really around virtualization, uh, we, which we started down the path about two and a half or three years ago, was to start uh, going from 100% physical servers, every application is on one or more servers, to being able to more effectively utilize our servers, utilize our people, and the technology that we have. VMware is a great partner. I think our whole goal is to have the cloud such that it's seamless and transparent, and our customers, our employees, and our other people in IT don't need to care about the technology that's underlying the delivery of the service, that we can deliver the products and services we need to in the most efficient way, uh, and VMware is part of that. Joining us today is Southwest Vice President of Technology and CTO. And trust me, this gentleman knows a little bit about aviation. He was actually a former naval officer himself and a naval aviator. And today, he is responsible 
for leveraging and using technology to differentiate Southwest Airlines in a very highly competitive, low-cost market called the airlines. Folks, it's great pleasure to welcome on stage Southwest Vice President of Technology and CTO, Mr. Bob Young. Bob. Thanks, Thanks for joining me, Bob. Appreciate it. So, Bob, why don't you share a little bit more about the success Southwest Airlines has had over the last 40 years? Well, as we've already mentioned, we're in our 40th anniversary. Going from being a little airline with two planes serving three cities in Texas, San Antonio, Dallas, and Houston, it's a little bit larger. We now have 550 Boeing 737 aircraft. We're serving 72 cities throughout the United States. We've gone from 200 employees to just about 35,000. Wow. Additionally, you talk a lot about our customer service. Everybody wants to know. We're one of Forbes' most admired companies in the world. But what it really boils down to is our employees. Our employees providing that positively outrageous customer service to our customers, making us a very fortunate airline to be here after 40 years, this being our 38th consecutive year of profitability. We have some of the best employees, best customers in the industry. We don't like to nickel and dime our customers. You know, we don't charge change fees, not a lot of the other fees around there. And uh, bags fly free. Yeah, I think everyone loves that commercial where they're, all your ground crew is waving to the bags and they have a little tear in their eyes. That's a great commercial. Um, so talk to us a little bit about how you're leveraging technology to service not just you know, your customers, but actually to drive revenue for Southwest itself. Because I believe greater than 80% of your revenue comes through online services. Yeah, that's a great point. In March, 84% of our revenue came in online. And that's customers and people like yourselves build, booking and paying online. We've also become very aggressive in going where our customers want to go. So we have a very aggressive social media strategy, you know, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, so we can better communicate back and forth with our customers. Additionally, we want to go where our customers are. Consumerization of IT has made an imperative for us to continue developing and deploying into the mobile space. So what role does VMware play in supporting your current initiatives and your future strategy of the company? Well, really over the last several years, a couple years ago when I came in, we were virtually no yeah. virtualization, VMware. Today, in the last 18 months, we've really come on up to 40%. Uh, we're still going, we're still in the process of that. A significant part about getting to where we want to go towards you know, 80 to 100% over the next couple of years is being able to leverage the management and automation tools that VMware brings in its suite of products to allow us to deliver our services. Now you're spending a lot of time talking about the infrastructure, but you've also leveraged our vFabric solutions that Paul mentioned earlier. Why don't you talk a little bit about that and how it's actually accelerating your IT services? Absolutely, our relationship with VMware has expanded over the last you know, 18 months, really over the last year. We run a significant amount of our applications and services on the VMware infrastructure, but that is not just vSphere and vMotion, those type of things, but actually includes the rest of some of the other vFabric items, including Tomcat Server, Hyperic, and uh, most recently Gemfire to improve the customer's experience among a number of our different applications, including our website, southwest.com. That's great. Thanks for sharing your initial thoughts, Bob. Let's go join the other folks on the panel and have a couple questions for you all of you. So as CIOs and CTOs, have you, as you've deployed your private clouds, how has your relationship changed with that line of business or your business uh, counterparts? Let's start with you, Steve, if you don't mind. Well, whenever I would answer a question like this, I have two hats on. So internally focused, our internal customers say, oh, you can do things faster and cheaper? Fantastic. We don't need to know anymore. But externally, when we talk to our customers, in, in many cases who are as sophisticated as we are technically, they like the fact that they can go and turn to us, and to use Paul's example of plumbing, that they can find another place to do plumbing for them, a task that they didn't want to do themselves, mm -hmm. but that they can, they can do it with us. We're proven to be scalable. Uh, we're very secure in our plumbing. Uh, we're very uh, reliable in our plumbing. And we make sure when you put stuff in the plumbing, it gets from point A to point B as fast as possible, which conjures up images that maybe plumbing is not a good example for, but in any case. Uh, and they come to us for that. So the dialogue that we've had with our customers and what we refer to as, as the capital markets community is a brand new and very positive dialogue. That's great. 
David, how about yourself? Um, in, a, in our corporate culture, we, you know, globalize and grow is really a core theme. And you know, when we're able to not spend money or give money back to marketing, R and D, um, you know, new product development, that's our competitive advantage, right? So when they when they know I'm in, that's my interest as well, mm -hmm. and that I'm working really hard to that, it makes it makes the relationship very easy. Right? It's again that trust, that trust that you build, and that ability to execute and do it, you know, faster, better, cheaper, and you're you're completely aligned with them. And the cloud has really helped us do that. Thanks, Bob. How about yourself? Well, it's very interesting. My business customers are most of our business don't care where stuff is running as long as it's there. Our movement towards the cloud has really made a, a pretty significant shift for us in our availability of our applications, not just to our internal customers but also to our external customers. Mm -hmm. So now they want everything faster. Yeah. So earlier, David, I asked you, how do you differentiate between a highly virtualized environment and a private cloud? And you talked about some of the metrics you use to determine the difference. Uh, Steve, how about you? How do you uh, actually determine the difference? And what metrics are you looking at to differentiate between virtualization and a private cloud? Well, I, I think from a more qualitative standpoint and trying to differentiate between the two, the virtualized infrastructure is the entryway or the gateway to doing what we think of as a cloud. And again, in our particular instantiation of our cloud, uh, we offer the infrastructure, we offer platforms as a service, we offer software as a service, and for the particular needs of our customers, our cloud structure is app aware. We understand the needs of our customers. It's not a generic infrastructure uh, because it's very much tuned for that. So the cloud has a much bigger definition than just virtualization, but without it, uh, there is not much of a cloud. Yeah, very good. David, how about yourself? Any other thoughts? Well, I think, you know, we, we had a factory burn down in Venezuela a couple of months ago. No one was hurt. Um, and when I think of cloud, it was the ability of our, our, to literally move a country's operations into DR in two hours and 20 minutes. In the first two hours, we're finding the guys because it was a Sunday afternoon and bringing up you know, moving all the systems, bringing up the virtual desktops and putting everybody back to work so they could focus on, you know, you know, running the business again. I mean, that's a cloud, that's not virtualization. Yeah. So let's talk about hybrid clouds because we think ultimately one of the most efficient ways to run IT is through a hybrid cloud model. It's not private, it's not public, it's a combination of the two and you owning your own hybrid cloud. So why don't you talk about the thoughts of leveraging cloud services, not just internally within your own four walls of your data center, but externally as well. And Steve, I'm gonna start with you because back in May, we had the opportunity to announce a vertical cloud you know, for the capital market. So I'm gonna start with you first. Sure, so we, we focused on developing a private cloud to service the capital markets community. And we've been doing a pretty good job on that. The customers have been very receptive to it. And we, we believe, as far as we know, we're the first of our kind to do that. And so uh, it's very exciting to be on the leading edge that way. But we're not so silly as to think, uh, to paint ourselves into a corner and say it'll be the end all, uh, be all of all clouds. We know that we'll need to talk to other clouds, whether it be our customers' private clouds, whether it be public clouds. So what we've done is we made sure that even though we're focused on the private cloud for today, we have the facilities in place to be able to talk to those other sources of information and data and processing as we need to, as they make sense. Great. Now, David, I know when we spoke, you had a unique view of uh, how to use and leverage clouds, both yourself and with your business partners. Why don't you share with the, the audience what you're thinking about when it comes to public cloud? So what we see our next big foray is actually pushing pieces of our internal cloud out to actually start creating a, a B2B working space between you know, us and our third-party manufacturers, developers, our uh, customers, anybody that can utilize our systems because you know the capability that we have the richness of it you know and the fact that we can control it is something that we find very enticing and um, has great strategic value that's great and bob how about yourself what are you thinking about uh for southwest to leverage public cloud services and building a hybrid cloud well i think we're, we're very open to doing the hybrid cloud with with the public clouds uh, a couple of issues that we have or we see right now, number one is the economics. It is still far cheaper for us to go ahead and get all the, everything we need to build the cloud internally, manage it, et cetera. We've got a great team that can do that. The second item is really around security of the public clouds and, and how is that? So I think really in the next three to five years, we'll, we'll have the 
convergence of, of some of those areas to be able to solve that, and it might make sense for us to proceed forward in the public cloud at that point in time. Okay, great. So obviously with, with virtualization and cloud computing, it drives the convergence of all different types of technology in the data center, which means that it has to obviously put some organizational challenges or constraints on how you organize to support a cloud model, and it also may have some impact on your budget. Could, you know, Bob, you speak about, you know, the impact organizationally and also what it's done to the budget for IT? Absolutely. Well, the, the first thing that was most surprising for us is the ability of our Unix teams, Windows teams, and Linux teams really to start coming together and collaborating. Mm -hmm. We have a very small staff on all those. They've come together and they manage our entire plethora of applications that we've got deployed in kind of our private cloud today. So it's really coming together on that. From a budget perspective, of course, we're becoming more efficient in our spend, but the more efficient we become on spend, the more things people want to put in. Yeah. And so with this very small team over the last 12 months, we would have had to deploy an additional 1,000 servers into our environment that we have not had to deploy because we've been able to put it in the cloud technology, which is over and above our migration to our internal cloud. Right. Great, and David, how about yourself? You had a re really unique story about how many people you have in IT and the fact you haven't had to expand your staff. No, I mean, it, it's really that efficiency and effectiveness that we've seen with the cloud. I mean, I, to me it comes down to two things. Um, time, the amount of time we don't spend in operations has allowed us to take that, that human power, the brain power, and fo focus it at the business to do more. Uh, the second thing that we find really interesting is rate of change. Just, I mean, every week in Revlon, there's between 17 and 30 terabytes of change on our cloud. And so those two geometries really, you know, work together to create a whole new ecosystem. Now, in closing, guys, we have 20,000 of our closest friends and your peers, you know, either here or watching on the web. If you had one final thought you'd like to share with the audience today, what might that be? I'll start with you first, Steve. Sure, so it, very simply, pick your partners carefully. As we all know, every vendor that walks into you today has a cloud story, and some are robust and some are not so robust. In our particular case, we are inventing the future. We don't have models to copy, but we can't do it all ourselves. We need good partners to do it with. Not a large number of partners, but a small number of really good partners. And obviously, we think VMware is one of those partners because not only do they have a good track record, the technologies that are so important to take us to this point, but in terms of forward looking, we can count on them to give us the stuff that we think we need to create the future that we think we and our customers are expecting. Thanks for sharing it. David? Um, we did our journey, and the biggest lesson, it's not how much money you spend, but how you spend the money. We spent no extra money doing our transformation. It was really about how we spent that money and those choices. And I think, you know, that's, you can do it, is the number one thing. You really can. Thanks. Bob? Well, we're really talking about it. I mean, the cloud is here, so get on board. You really want to pick great technology. VMware's got that in a number of different areas that we've talked about. But the biggest thing for us and our team is the partnership we've gotten from VMware. We talked a little bit about how we expect our employees to provide that positively outrageous you know, really good customer service to our external customers. Well, we get that from VM, so it's not VMware. So it's not like having our team and VMware be able to provide the support. It's like it's almost your part of the team when we have to go get to some of those. And for the most part, the software works, so you don't have to do that very often at all. <laughs> That's true. Gentlemen, thank you for your kind words, and thank you for joining me here on stage today and sharing your success stories. Thanks. Thank you. So today you heard Paul talk about bridging the old way of delivering IT services on a very absolute programmatic path towards cloud computing. And it is our opportunity to work with you to jointly make sure you move in a way that you feel comfortable. It's also important to hear from customers like you just heard here today and to hear their own stories about how they've embarked upon their own journey towards cloud computing. And tomorrow on this stage, you'll actually get to see real life examples of our technology at work. And we have a very special presenter, as is always the case every year here at VMworld. We'll have our CTO, Dr. Stephen Herod, come up here 
and not only talk to you about more real life applications and how we're supporting them, but it'll have some really sizzling and exciting demos. And knowing Steve as well as I do, my guess is Steve is right now probably still working on his keynote for tomorrow. Ah, you smug pig, I'll get you yet. Cheetos and iPads, really bad idea. Oh, hey Carl. How hey you Steve, doing? good. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm all ready for the keynote tomorrow, 8 a.m. We have great technology futures. I promise you some great demos, and uh, we're even gonna have a few special guests on stage. You feeling good? All right, so we'll see you tomorrow morning. So that's something you won't want to miss, and uh, I promise you that Monster VM won't disrupt Steve as he's up here. Folks, we thank you for joining us at VMworld 2011, our largest VM world ever, and we encourage you now to go to the welcome reception that is right behind us. You can go out on either side of the general session here and enjoy VMware's own band, Elastic Sky. Thank you, and enjoy the conference. <laughs>